forward. There we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Careering Ahead. I'm Naomi Mella, a vet for the British Horse Racing Authority, and I am delighted to welcome you this evening to an interview with Ashley Wichard, who has joined us this evening. Um, a few of you are just logging on, so I'll give you a couple of minutes. Um, just to say, as usual, this is recorded. Um, they go on the YouTube channel, and all our previous interviews can be found on the Women in Racing website. If you just hop on there, under the resources section, there is a whole bit about the interviews that we've done before. Um, we've had some fantastic previous guests. So if you have missed any of them, you can go back and re-watch them. Um, if you've got any questions this evening, we love questions, um, do pop them in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that during the evening. And if you've got anything you want to ask Ash, then do feel free to stick it in the chat box. She's really friendly, don't be shy. And um, we would love to have a few of you asking questions for us. Um, so yeah, please to welcome Ash. So she is a Master Practitioner in Neuro Linguistic Programming. It's a little bit of a mouthful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so she's been in racing on and off for about 10 years, um, has worked for the likes of Neil Mulholland. Ash has led up at the Grand National, which is pretty cool. We're definitely going to talk about that. Um, and has done a host of other things, including working in the charitable sector and the education sectors with um, kids with autism and some kind of behavioral and learning difficulties, as well as with um, youth offenders and men in prison, which is really interesting. And we're definitely going to talk about that as well. So um, she's currently the vice chair of BERF, which is the BAME Equestrian and Rural Focus Group, which is a new thing. Um, I'm super excited that that is going to be a focus for us this evening. And she has also just become a women in racing mentor. Yay. Um, so little plug for the mentoring scheme. Um, if you haven't got a mentor and you're a member, there is one for pretty much everybody. So um, whatever your field you're in or whatever you want to do, then um, don't be shy about signing up for a mentor because it's really helpful. And I've had one and I have to say it's been a brilliant experience. Um, so whether you think you need one or not, just look into it because it might be something that's really helpful for your career. Um, it's free and it's definitely a perk of the Women in Racing membership. So, um, yeah, it can be really great. Um, so, Ash, thanks for joining us. Um, I was just going to start back at the beginning um, to say... How did you get into horses in the first place? You grew up in Wiltshire in Bradford-on-Avon. Yeah. Tell us about how you got started on your kind of horsey journey, as it were. Um, well, my, my parents worked full time and uh, my, they, well, they had a friend who had a horse. And basically me and my sister would go off and ride this horse at the weekends with a lady called Lorraine. And um, yeah, it literally started from there. And then I went straight into riding Jim Carner games ponies. Uh, Prince Philip Cup and I learned a lot from that actually because <laughs> in, in all fairness our coaches were vile um, mm -hmm. I don't actually think that they would be allowed <laughs> to train anybody uh, you know under the age of 18 um, like nowadays because they were really hard um, you know if you fell off it wasn't there was no sympathy it was a bit swearing get back on that pony okay. um, so from a young age it was you just if you fell off you got straight back on and just didn't complain about it and I think actually that did me the world of good to be honest with you yeah um, I then sort of went on from riding games ponies to just riding friends ponies um couldn't afford one of our own um mm -hmm. so it was literally just picking up the odds and sods just wherever someone had a pony to ride I would just yeah okay that's for me <laughs> <laughs> um it happened at shows as well sometimes if there was a pony that needed a quick clear round just to make sure it was okay before the the actual daughter's uh, the the owner's daughter got on sort of thing that I did that too um and I think just having the confidence to ride more challenging ponies sort of eased me straight into riding thoroughbreds actually mm. Um, it's really interesting that because actually there's kind of a fallacy that to get into racing you have to have like had your own ponies and grown up going to pony club and all this kind of thing and like I didn't we couldn't afford for me to have a pony when I was little so I just rode in riding schools and then same as you like rode friends ponies and like got experience that way and actually it's it's kind of refreshing to hear that you can do it without necessarily having loads of money and having the opportunity to to ride a pony of your own I guess I think I mean, I'm 34 now, and when I go, obviously, I'm going back for quite a few years. 
but um there back then there were yards that you literally would just go to and they'd have you graft all day mm. for a half an hour pony ride at the end oh my of the god day. me too <laughs> and, and, and that's exactly what it was but we loved it and we'd be there in the holidays we'd be there at the weekends you know your parents would drop you off they knew that we were safe well sort of you know <laughs> riding <laughs> without body protectors and all the rest of it but generally we were safe they knew where we were so we we could just literally work hard in the yard all day and have a little ride you know at the end and Mm. that was enough for us at the time Mm. so Mm. Mm. so once you left school how did your journey kind of continue on from there into into work and racing Uh, I had a baby quite young I was um I had my daughter two weeks after my 17th birthday wow so um she was probably about I did I did a couple of like part-time jobs um but when she got into um she must have been about three or four and I thought right okay now I can now she's at school I can sort of think about getting a sort of more sort of full-time job if you like um and that's when I went to work for Chloe Roddick Mm -hmm. and that was uh, Chloe was amazing and her standards were just up there so to sort of go into racing um working for Chloe was really good I really enjoyed it and she was a satellite a satellite yard for Paul Nichols as well so we had some really nice horses Mm, that must have been super cool as a first job yeah (laughs) well I didn't I would I would get on a horse I'm not joking and I'd be like yeah this one's okay and then they'd be like yeah that one's probably worth about that much and (laughs) you'll probably see it at Cheltenham and I was like all right (laughs) I didn't have a clue I just they were just horses so I just enjoyed riding them I knew nothing about their careers or what they'd achieved or anything and how did you end up with Chloe like if you didn't have you it sounds like you didn't have like a massive interest in racing at that point did you just take a job because there was a job available with that I think I skipped a little bit there because my cousin um had some rehab horses um, stables a bit closer to home and I used to work on the yard as a teenager Mm-hmm. Um, and then my schoolwork started to suffer so I was mum and dad were like no actually you've got to focus on your schoolwork <laughs> um, but I didn't I enjoyed working with the thoroughbreds then and my cousin he started he was a point-to-point rider okay um, so I started riding some of their point-to-point horses um, and it went on from there and um, okay then I fell pregnant with my daughter and then the rest is history <laughs> mm. and as and what you know we've we, a lot of people will know that we've had a, this project going on with women in racing called Racing Home recently, which is about working mothers in the racing industry. Like, how did you fit your um, racing work around having your daughter at that stage? Because obviously, did you have a lot of help or did you use nurseries? Like, how did you fit it all in? Because I know it's something that we talk about a lot as being a barrier to women in the industry is childcare and that kind of balancing act, I guess, Ash, mm-hmm. of like juggling it all. You know, how did yeah. you find that? Um, Phoenix was going to, my daughter's called Phoenix, she Mm -hmm. was going to uh, breakfast club in the morning Mm. and then I would come home at lunchtime, um, pick her up from school or my nan would pick her up from school and sometimes I'd bring her back to the yard with me, Chloe was really relaxed and you know she she was really happy for me to bring Phoenix along if I needed to, Um, Mm -hmm. otherwise my nan was really helpful back then as well when she was a bit more sort of able Mm-hmm. Uh, and she was able to drive she she'd do some pickups but sort of like the split shifts did did work better mm. uh, as a you know single as a single parent so yeah it was mm. hard but you, you make it work if you enjoy it you you make it work and there is always a way <laughs> totally it's refreshing to hear like Chloe is saying that you can bring her in and you know take your daughter with you and stuff that's definitely something we've heard about as being like an encouragement to to racing staff is that like this in the smaller yards where there's a more kind of family atmosphere and stuff like you can kind of bring your kids with you and you know I think that's really nice that they that they sort of see you working and you know know that you're kind of in the industry and and this that and the other so well that's great and and where did you progress onto from there like how did you kind of shape up over the next few years because I know you obviously went on to Neil Mulholland's eventually like how did your kind of riding career grow from there? So I went from Chloe's. Now, Chloe was, um, she was a few miles away from me. So the commute was the the difficult part there. Mm-hmm. Um, but Michael Blake's yard was just down the road, uh, mm-hmm. only about three miles. Um, so I started working for Michael Blake. And that's where um, I learned very quickly, you know, you just get on with it. That's all we used to say, you know, whenever someone, <laughs> I don't really want to school that 
three-year-old horse over that hurdle and I'd just get on with it and it really did, <laughs> really did. and you know all, that still sticks with me now um so I, I did a lot of firsts there I you know went out of the stalls I was um schooling the youngsters over the hurdles um yeah bring riding breakers so I sort of I, I did some of that at Chloe's but because she she was really experienced that so she just sort of carried on with it and we would help on the floor sort of thing mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. yeah definitely Michael's I started to really take on most of the sort of work that you know around the horses like yeah most things the only thing mm. I could do at Michael's was drive a lorry but yeah Mm, I find that prospect of breaking in is like that's such a skill in its own right isn't it I'm far too chicken for that kind of thing but like sitting on babies when you're kind of breaking them in I definitely think is like a such a skill in its own right that is really like learned and crafted through your riding skills I reckon yeah I, I genuinely think the the my sort of my start in in riding horses and stuff because I had such tough people just saying just get on with it and mm. you know there's no sympathy you you literally Mm. do and I was watching Chloe bring a lot of her youngsters into work and for the first time and I'd be like oh my god like this woman is crazy she (laughs) she just doesn't care like when I say doesn't care she would just get on anything even if it looked like it was going to throw off and I was quite sort of like overwhelmed at the start but yeah by the time I then went on to Michael's I was quite sort of confident that I would be able to do that too Mm, mm. which is great and and I mean how do you think that attitude like shapes you into the future you know like that kind of just get on and do it attitude that you mentioned like do you think that has had an effect on how you view work and how how what your attitudes are around kind of getting on with the job I guess I love I love being part of a team so Mm. I think for me that was a real strength of mine is being able to take one for the team if necessary if Mm. they're difficult horse and I had a sort of quietish ride I'd be happy to swap over um I remember one of my colleagues she was coming back from injury and I said look you know I'll take that horse if you're not too sure about mm. it you ride mm. the one that I'm on I know that it's safer mm. um and yeah and it's just sort of working as a team and, and sort of looking out for your colleagues mm. Mm. that's so important isn't it especially in smaller yards like yeah I think that kind of team atmosphere and stuff is is really important and I love the kind of conversations that we're more starting to have around building that team ethos in in racing yards and like really looking out for one another and like looking after people so how long were you with Michael for Ash like how long did you work there for um I was with Michael for a few years actually yeah Mm. yeah um and then I left in 2013 Mm mm-hmm to go to Neil Mulholland's, which again, we're all, re- I was smack bang in the middle, literally. Well. <laughs> yeah, you're well placed where you are, aren't you? Really so. <laughs> um, and then that's, that's when sort of like, because Michael was a small yard, um, when I went to Neil's, obviously more horses, mm. therefore, you know, the horses were coming in that were getting better and better. Um, so the, the meets that we were going to were getting more sort of, there was more racing on a Saturday and, you know the races were just more competitive and it was just yeah that's mm. I, I I had the best times at Neil's honestly so you I, I did read that you read up you led up the Druid's nephew at the 2015 Grand National can you talk to us a little bit about that because that is an experience that like not very many people have in their life you know yeah. that kind of buzz in the atmosphere can you just talk to us about that kind of draw of the big occasion I guess and like what it's like doing that oh I I mean, it was so unreal. I mean, we had like banners um, on the, we have a, there's a main road that's sort of just outside the yard and there's big banners and we left the yard and it's like, good luck, Druid's nephew. Oh my God, wow, really? Yeah, because Bradford on Avon and, and Winsley, it's a small place. So yeah. you know, there was a lot of team sort of spirit for the Druid's nephew. Um, and we went up and I had had my nails painted red and white. Um, I had red extensions in. Um, I was I was sort of dressed like I was going to Ladies' Day. <laughs> cool. And I thought, actually, I am just going to carry on with this. And I went into the paddock with sunglasses on, my fascinator, and I just thought, I don't know if I'll ever do this again. So I'm literally mm. um, just going to make the most of it. But it was just unreal. 
Mm. It's a bonkers atmosphere, isn't it? Yeah, I led up the Drew's nephew with a lad called James. There was a lot of um, sort of press coverage around James not long afterwards um, because he um, he needed a bit of support and he sort of needed a leg up and started working for Neil. Mm. Uh, I don't think he'd had much experience of horses too much before that. So for him to have been in that position, mm. too, we led up together, which was really, really nice. That is really nice. It's good to have someone to experience that with and like be able to talk about it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, just being in the paddock and I think Claire Balding was in there and AP McCoy and all these things. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, this is incredible. <laughs> Ah, so fun. And um, so you've obviously had like a lot of experiences in racing, um, but your career has moved on from there. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit about what led you out of racing? Because you've you've done some really quite different things, Ash, actually. And like, you know, obviously going on to work with autistic children and children with kind of social and educational needs is, is one thing. And then you've got your work with young offenders. Like, what was it that kind of turned your head, I guess, away from horses and, and led you in a bit of a different direction? I'd been suff- I'd suffered from eczema um, really bad, even when I worked for Michael Blake. Mm. Um, and the fact that I couldn't get a break from it mm. meant that my eczema never got any better. Mm. Um, and I was riding, what, five lots a day at Neil's. Um, and then we'd have to groom sort of nine in the afternoon after we'd ridden, which is great. I absolutely loved it, but I just wasn't doing my skin any favours. Mm. Um, and... I remember being at Chepstow Racecourse one day in the canteen and, you know, Neil would said something about, oh, you know, you, you don't have to go, you know, and I, I, I was just like, look at my hands, all the backs mm. of my hands were cracked. I was like, I cannot live like this anymore. Like, I'm really struggling. I'd go to the shops and I'd be sort of holding my hands like that so they mm. wouldn't see the backs of my... It was just lots of... Uh, I'd spent a long time um, sort of suffering in silence mm, mm. Try and it's such them. a difficult thing is that my brother has eczema really badly and to, and having seen what he has suffered over the years with that I really I feel for you because actually I think it's one of those conditions that people don't really understand like the discomfort levels associated with it is just agonizing isn't it pitching like, oh, this like seriously please don't come. <laughs> That's like the worst thing you can say <laughs> um so yeah, I made the decision. I had a friend that worked um, in a in a um, uh, specialist a specialist school called. Uh, it was part of the Priory, mm. um, and I worked with autistic children and children with Aspergers, um, and that was alright. My skin started to get better. It. I enjoyed the job because I was learning something new. Mm but it wasn't a hundred percent making me happy. Um, and then the same friend got another job in another school, which was more for children with uh, boys with behavioral issues, um, okay. the Monday to Friday residential school. Mm-hmm. So I ended up following her and going there. Cause she was like, Oh, they still got, you know, they still got space. Why don't you go and have a chat with the head teacher? Okay. So I did that. Um, And I started off as a teaching assistant and then there was an opportunity to be on the behaviour support team, which is literally when the kids are in crisis, you will go to the classroom when the tables and chairs are flying and and support them out of the classroom. Um, And yeah, and so I was, no one went for it. (laughs) (laughs) I knew that, yeah. (laughs) I'll give it a go. I thought it might be a little bit more exciting, so yeah did that and I really enjoyed that and um from there I found out about Key for Life mm. and Life is a charity that works with horses music and sport to engage uh young men between the ages of 18 and 30 into meaningful activity or employment and oh it was just such an amazing job so many different opportunities and I even managed to support one of the young men into racing, which was just, Mm. oh, I loved it. I actually really enjoyed going on that journey with him. Um, So, yeah. Yeah, cool. I'm just going to backtrack a little tiny bit, actually, and just pick up on one or two things that you've mentioned in there. Um, So when you went to initially into the 
schools with for autistic children and then on to where you were doing the crisis management like what did you get training on the job for that because actually if you haven't got a background with any kind of formal experience like how do you kind of settle yourself into that situation because knowing what to do in that kind of crisis moment you're like you know so with um with most schools that deal with autism as like behavioral issues um there's uh what's called team teach mm -hmm. a restrictive physical intervention and okay. this is the sort of biomechanics of the body um to be able to sort of for instance by by locking down somebody's elbow to the to their side they lose the power of their arms therefore they okay. can't break out it's that sort of thing okay 95 percent de-escalation yeah five percent restrictive physical intervention yeah. hey i still remember <laughs> She still got it. Yeah, I still remember. Um, I did a tutor's course actually as well. Yeah. Cool. And I know you said that you that your your work with horses was was really beneficial in those situations. What do you think the skills are that kind of translate across Ash? Because I find that really interesting that having that kind of background with the animals and all the work that you've done previously was super useful in kind of upskilling you for those jobs. Like, can yeah. you just chat to us a little bit about that? Well, I went to a conference once and this this guy started talking and we were all looking at each other like, what, who, what's this guy talking about? Who is he? Turned out he had autism. Okay. And he then started talking about how actually people with autism are very similar to horses. They will not tell you when something is wrong most mm -hmm. of the time. Okay. Um, they are not able to articulate it in a lot of cases. Um, so it is fight, flight, or freeze. Same as horses. You don't approach a horse when its nostrils are flaring and he looks like he's on his toes. You give him a bit of space and you respect them. And you know, and it's very similar to children um, and, and adults with autism or Asperger's. And yeah, it, it literally is working out and uh, their triggers and doing it without the verbal communication. So mm -hmm. it's about mm -hmm. body language and being really observant and mindful. Mm, mm, so interesting, so interesting. And actually when you kind of think about it and you break it down like that, of course there's loads of parallels and the and human behavior and animal behavior are not that different at the end of the day, I guess, are they? But like translating that across in a really easy to understand way and, and actually teaching people that the skills they have from horses are super useful with those kind of cues and triggers mm -hmm. into doing, in, you know, moving into another sphere of work, I guess, is something we don't talk about a lot yeah it was you know I actually did a bit of work today with some of the students I worked with mm -hmm. um, who would be you know on that sort of spectrum and it was all about boundaries and how you approach somebody and I I w approached one of the horses really directly and mm -hmm. sort of walking with a purpose and the horse spun on its um hocks basically and shot off and I just looked at him and I was like well why did he do that you know and then they were able to say oh because you know you you scared him mm -hmm. and then I could use that and say well how should I have walked towards him then and let them tell me mm -hmm. um and then I sort of try and associate with that with how they like to be interacted with and approached as well so mm -hmm. they're really tools for that kind of thing as well mm -hmm. so when she moved on to key for life and um, that was where you started to work with kind of young offenders and and people in prison at that stage i read somewhere something somewhere that you took a horse to a prison ash is that true yeah <laughs> that's yeah. awesome they were riding around one with scrubs no way. okay and tell me that story because that is a great story i can it's the first time i've ever been in a prison myself okay. um, and yeah we we sort of um our group was uh, some of the young men were brought off the wings to the chapel. That's where we did our sort of program, run a program. Mm. And um, Hartshaw Horses, I think it was. I think that's their name. So we used their horses mm -hmm. and they come up. And yeah, the, the guys were absolutely petrified. Some of them were, oh, no, not getting on. And, you know, these these guys are probably quite hardened criminals, some of them. Um and no, not no, not getting on, not getting on. By the end of it, all of them have gotten on. But you had people sort of hanging out of the windows, trying to get your attention. It was the, the most strangest thing because you know they were hanging hankies out the window, you know, just just to get noticed. And it was, 
but um it was a really good experience to be able to see them petrified and you know that they they cannot put keep that front going if you know what i mean mm -hmm. when they're confronted with a horse they cannot hold that sort of that mask has to slip mm -hmm. um, and it mm -hmm. did a lot of them and but i think that also help them in the long run to actually bond with each other in that in that sort of um in that group mm -hmm. from, like, from different wings and actually the different wings were rivals but while they were with us they respected us mm -hmm. and they didn't do anything mm -hmm. it was like when they got back to the wing they had their little brawl <laughs> Yeah, leave it out while you're with the horses. Yeah, so. it and was incredible because I was on the, I literally went out onto the wing to find young men to bring onto the program. Wow. Then, you know, you've got metal grates above your head, four stories high. Christ. And um, so it was a, it was a hell of an experience, but I loved it. I didn't feel intimidated. I just took it for what it was and tried to sort of engage some of the guys. Mm -hmm, definitely. And do you think, just from all the work that you've done that kind of interaction would happen with other animals apart from horses or do you think there's something kind of uniquely special about riding a horse and that kind of horse bond like what's your view on that ash i think dogs are quite small therefore don't necessarily require the same amount of boundaries Okay. I think, um, you know, when you have pet therapy and you have people bringing dogs into schools, that's great. Some some kids love that. But other children will still tower above a dog and look down and, and not, ha you know, the, the boundaries aren't there. Mm. But with regards to horses, you can't not respect their boundary. Mm. Um, mm. And I think that's the difference. And I don't really know of any bigger animals that are domesticated, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah you don't you don't really get the same experience with a cow do you <laughs> so. oh, no. oh we have them at work just... <laughs> uh, so um tell us about the sort of mainstay of your your role with key for life then because that was um the sort of it's a charity um that as you said does lots of work with sort of sport and and horses um in rehabilitation of of offenders can mm -hmm. you just talk a little bit about what your role there involved because you were a caseworker and, and the equine coordinator ash and um, just talk to us a bit about about that role and what you did um apart from going to worm with scrubs <laughs> yeah um so we were trying you know trying to get them uh, the young men jobs we were their parents we were their friends we were their taxis we were I mean, I remember taking one young man to the dentist and holding his hand while he was having a tooth pulled out. You know, mm. it was everything. Mm. You know, if mm. you could do anything to support one of the, a, a young man that's going through something, then you did it, you know. And I think that's one thing I really enjoyed. There wasn't really any limits to the job. Mm. It was just you, you do what you need to do to get this person into a better state. Mm. Um, you know, some of them had no family. Some of them, the only time they'd worn a suit was to a funeral. So <laughs> you were just whatever you could be for them. That that's what you did. Um, mm -hmm. I personally, I used to work um, on a. I think it was a Friday. We used to do uh, equine sessions, little workshops for some of the young men that really enjoyed being around the horses. They were given a more of an opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. um and that turned into riding lessons and from there we had a couple of young men go to a local polo yard um wow. do some work there and another young man like I said went off to um he went to the national um racing college in mm. Dom there Mm. Yeah, so talk to me about his journey, because um, going from living in a hostel in London to being at the Northern Racing College and, and carrying on into work is is a big deal. And, you know, for you to support him through that must have been super satisfying for, for both of you, I guess. It was, it was. And um, we worked with the Bridge of Hope and the Resume Foundation, mm -hmm. um, and they were amazing. Their leg up, uh, the Bridge of Hope is the the sort of leg up charity that helps people to get into any kind of job within the racing industry. And we went through them to get this young man into the Northern Racing College. And then 
he spent the best part of a year with um, one of the top trainers in the Southwest. He's now in Lambourne and wow. I spoke yesterday and oh, it, <laughs> honestly, it's just so nice. He, he said, oh, you know, I'm going to be here for a long time. He was just so happy. And to hear Good. that, he's just so lovely. Mm, mm. That's incredible, isn't it? And actually, it's, I'd say it's hard to replicate that feeling of um, knowing that that person has gone on to something really meaningful as a result of your influences, because not many people get to experience that joy, I suppose, in their working life that, you know, knowing that through your mentorship and your support and and his hard work and his own endeavours, like between the two of you, he's he's gone on to something great really it, it definitely is a feeling um but that that's definitely something that really motivates me and mm. I take so much pride in knowing that I can help somebody mm. achieve their goals or, or you know help them realize their own potential even because mm. um, he mm. would and what his goals were when I met him no you know, no. apart from apart from moving out of London, um, that was it sort of thing. So mm. Mm. And now and hopefully I get to do that with lots more people, you know. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and and you so you're doing some career coaching now. Um, I'm gonna come on to the neurolinguistics in a bit, but um I know you you're setting up a business doing that. Is that right, Ash, in terms of coaching and things? At the moment it's it's I'm not really setting up a business, but it's something that I at the moment use on the side okay um, I think we when I first did my NLP practitioners course it was part of key for life that's mm-hmm. what, because our young men needed that support and that work with emotional resilience and mm-hmm. in order to be able to do that correctly the same way as our lead trainer um, Dave Gardner did you know we needed to have that training um, I then decided to take the the sort of take it a step further and do the mastery course because I just it changed me as a person when Mm. you do um, NLP you have to go through it yourself Mm. um, in order to be able to help other people so just talk to us about what NLP is for anyone that's not heard of neuro-linguistic programming what is it Ash and and how does it work because I think a a bit of a definition would be a bit useful so it's all about um, reframing the way you think about things okay Uh, you know, if there have been negative um, situations in the past that are blocking you and stopping you from moving forwards, um, or if there's that, you know, one person that you just want to cut ties with them, but you don't know how to, it's techniques that are able to support you in doing that, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it stops you from having that feeling that you put towards it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, for example, if I tripped over the front doorstep or something you know that could really frustrate me Mm. Um, but over time if I if I did the right techniques then actually I wouldn't see that as a an issue anymore and what are the sort of techniques that you employ with that so um we would use oh gosh there's lots of different ones okay okay like you can um the it's all about the images you create in your mind okay okay Um, and if you start messing about with the images, so if you change the color, make it black and white and not colored, um, or if you make it 2D instead of 3D in your mind sort of thing, and, and literally ch- and if you if it's a person that's wound you up, you could always put a hat on them or some funny glasses. You can literally change the image in your head. Mm-hmm. And then when you actually go back to thinking about that image that really wound you up in the past, you can't because you've changed the image already. It's quite a... It's fascinating. It, it, I find it really hard to describe to explain. <laughs> I know some people will be able to explain it a lot easier than me, but I'm just a bit but um you know I I I think that red cars are unlock unlucky for me. Right. But somebody would love to go out and buy a red Ferrari. <laughs> what I mean, it's perceptions and yeah. It's, like yeah. it's about changing your kind of mindset and your perception around what's happened in your life, I guess. That's um, it. But it's all about it's all about positive change. Mm. It's about no things if I said to you you know we've just been talking about a red car tomorrow you'll probably go out and notice every red car that's driving down the road whereas before 
wouldn't have even thought about it so mm. it's when you get drawn to other things um they then become sort of more in the forefront of your mind should yeah I say. it's like when you buy a new car and you never see that car before and then once you've bought one you see them everywhere don't you yeah. um yeah it's amazing and so tell us about what you're up to at the moment ash with your work um with nlp and and the work that you're doing at the moment um working you know through 2020 and how that's been affected by the pandemic and bits and bobs i think that with nlp it's all about positive outcomes and trust in the process and that kind of thing and for me this over the whole of 2020 I feel like I've made every decision count mm. where before I may not have done mm. um it NLP's taught me that actually if there are people having a bad day but they're you know if, if they're having a go at me for instance or if I think someone's being rude then rather than just take it personally I think actually that person's probably had quite a bad day today maybe they've had an argument with their partner or you know maybe they've just stubbed their toe I I think about things a lot more before I just think oh well it's a personal um sort of attack if you like or, mm. or anything those lines um mm. specifically with George Floyd Mm -hmm. uh, murder of George Floyd and a lot of the comments um, that were posted on Facebook though I could have been drawn into so many arguments but actually you're not going to change people's perceptions by arguing with them mm -hmm. because the second you argue that the, the point is lost anyway mm -hmm. um, so I was I was I found myself a lot of the time saying you know that's your opinion you're entitled to your opinion because that's how you've grown up and that's your perception of how this has happened and all the rest of it but that's not mine mm. um and that's how I've tried to tackle the different sort of negative comments and stuff that's come in regarding that for instance so it's definitely it's definitely helped me um I've, I've definitely not been in half as many arguments as what I could have been <laughs> <laughs> 19 <laughs> <laughs> yeah refreshing take on 2020 and you've got a um you know really booming instagram following and um, for anyone that doesn't follow ash she is at miss black equestrian and she does fantastic work there i would highly recommend that you follow her oh look at that um and uh yeah so you know you've got quite a quite a big following there do you encounter much negativity amongst that or do you find that people are generally very positive about what you're doing um I haven't found much negativity at all um, I found with the article in the horse and hound that I had out in July there was a little bit of you know people's opinions but at the end of the day that's that like I said that's their perspective um on how they've been raised and what they think mm -hmm. um, how can I turn around and say that that's wrong mm -hmm. when that's what they've grown up believing so mm -hmm. and then I know well, sorry go on you go right no I was just gonna say but my my Instagram has been really positive and, and mm. I'm I really appreciate all the support that I've had and mm. I just hope that I can be one of the many people trying to change the narrative um by being that sort of brown face if you like in mm. a questionism because mm. there's not many I'm not a I'm not a um, competitive dressage rider or anything like that, you know, I'm not, but I love riding horses. I've had a, a career in riding horses for a while and, you know, I'd like to ride some more. <laughs> <laughs> and actually building those communities and finding like-minded people with whom to share an opinion and therefore spread the word out to a wider audience, I think is is kind of key in in terms of inducing change in the longer term and you know there's a lot of chat about diversity in racing at the moment a lot of you watching this will know that Rishi Passad um did some stuff on tv with Josh Apiafi last week or the week before um and you know the criticism that came from Rishi's interview was really strong and and really awful in a lot of respects and I think it is changing the narrative as you say through people 
getting out there and doing it like yourself, I think is, is really important. And along those lines, you, you're now involved with the um, BAME Equine and Rural Focus Group. Can you just talk us um, through a little bit about that, Ash, and what the goals are of that organisation? Because I know Sandra, who um, founded or is the chair of that, is quite the woman and uh, you're the vice chair. So do you want to just tell us a little bit about that group and, and for anyone that would like to follow that, they also are on Instagram and well worth a follow. Um, just chat us a little bit about that, Ash, and, and what the work you're doing with them. Yeah, so we are a at least 200 strong now in wow. members on Facebook. Cool. Um, it's a working uh, Facebook group and we have lots of different people um, from all different nationalities and races and we've got some international members as well which is great and we are basically show uh, for instance when when we first start like when Sandra first started it most of the people that were coming in were like oh my god I thought I was the only black person that rode horses you know because that's what they were in their area mm. but now what we're starting to realize is there have been lots of mixed race and black riders and you know people of color riding horses but the spotlight's never been on them mm. so they have been there and there is talent there but the spotlight's over there and it could be over here sort of thing so um i think we're empowering our young fame riders and giving them lots of um imagery to be able to and representation for them to actually say oh my god you know I could, I could do this and mm. there are black people going and eventing and all the rest of it and there are you know there's a few not lots but there's a few black jockeys and all the rest of it so we are a group of people trying to make a difference for the next sort of generation mm. we've also had um parents join as well that's awesome who are, who are white parents to mixed race children mm -hmm who have gone to shows and never actually realized how their child felt at the show mm. because they've been so wrapped up in, you know, making sure the pony's okay and making sure that everything's tapped up correctly and, you know, their entries are in, um, but never really even thought for one second that actually their mixed race child might, might be feeling slightly isolated or a, a, a way because they are the only person like them in you know a competition so there are other parents like that as well so it's a nice community for people to share those experiences but also we provide um like a platform for people to post opportunities for whether it's modeling or whether it's anything really but mm. If people are looking for black riders will come and look on our page sort of thing mm. but if you want to look on our page um you need to be able to post a bio about yourself because we're all about transparency you want to know who who you are where you come from what you're doing um and, and why you want to be part of the group so that's one of the things that we ask for when people join the the um facebook group just so that we know and we can try and safeguard as best we can mm. Um, mm. So important, especially when you've got young people in there as well, I guess, like having that safeguarding is is absolutely vital, isn't it? So um, and um, what are you, you know, you yourself, are, you know, you're doing um, lots of stuff around kind of role modeling, I guess, you know, that old thing of you can't be what you can't you can't be what you can't see, which is a phrase that I really love. And um, as you mentioned, you've been in horse and hound this year, which is very cool. Um, what other opportunities have you got kind of? coming up or like what are you working on Ash in terms of kind of promoting the diversity agenda I guess and and like what are you what can where can people find what you're up to in the next few months I suppose with with the work that you're doing on that front um I can't really say too much right now <laughs> um but obviously I'm a mentor for women in race and I'm really looking forward to getting mm. my back into that um I'd love to I'd, I'd love to be recognized as, you know, one of the BAME representatives in racing. I know I'm not, you know, working full time in racing, but I worked in racing and there aren't many other people queuing up to do this right now. So <laughs> with that being said, <laughs> I'm quite happy to take that on. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to promote it however I can. I'm really lucky to have a four year old thoroughbred 
that. Oh my um, God, it was a beaut. Your oh, horse is an absolute beaut as well. <laughs> but I, you, law of attraction, I put that out into the universe and said, I, I really want a horse that I can just ride as if he's my own, but I don't want the bills. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've got it. So, I, you know, I, I've got him to work with he's a really nice project um and so now I'm able to be that face and I'm able to have those pictures out there of us doing things it's you know we're not competitive Christ but we're out there doing things you know and I think that's that's what it's about is just being seen at the moment and saying yes to every opportunity mm-hmm. brilliant and um just in terms of your work with with NLP, um, what's your what's your sort of future path with that, Ash? And, and can you talk to us a little bit about what you're up to at the moment with that work? Um, at the moment, it's pretty quiet because I have a full time job at you know at a school, but okay. I think I quite like to tie that in with working with the horses. Um, I'm slowly but surely sort of pulling things together um I've now got myself a trailer and a car to tow it <laughs> so I'm going to be more mobile um and I'm really hoping that at some point um, I always wanted to be able to take horses into schools um mm. and and give them that experience because a lot of kids don't actually get to see horses up and close which is why they then don't maybe maybe they don't realize they actually like horses mm. so they're way way older um but it sort of brings me on to thinking about how you could improve or not you personally but how we could improve um the amount of people coming in to work in the racing industry because having worked with lots of different people of all ages with various complex needs I've noticed that actually quite a lot of them work well with animals with horses Mm. Mm. and I think that actually that could be a really good demographic of people to target because let's face it you don't have to be academic to ride horses and be be with animals you don't have to be sociable to work Mm. with animals do you know what I mean there's a lot of Mm. things just don't have to you don't have to be you could work on the yard all day you don't really have to speak to anybody you just do your job and mm. and I think that actually that might be something worth looking into so mm. and in a time where you know retention in the workforce and and the workforce in the racing industry is is a, a hot topic because people are constantly looking for staff mm-hmm. you know we I think there is a tendency for us to kind of think about this box that people are in you know and actually thinking outside into a more neurodiverse population and that demographic like you say is is something that I bet you nobody's considered but actually there's a wealth of experience and skills and people with really good potential out there that are not being fully utilized at the moment you've got all these um pupil referral units and you know people leaving care how how many of those people end up looking for that sort of sense of belonging Mm. and then getting caught up in county lines or you know being exploited either um criminally or sexually whatever because Mm. they're vulnerable and they're just looking for a sense of belonging Mm. well if anybody's looking for a sense of belonging go enjoy the racing yard and Mm. you know you'll be part of the family like that and you'll have a reason to wake up in the morning Mm. you'll have structure to a structure to your day and you'll have a reason, like I said, to wake up because the horses need to be fed. They need to be looked after. Mm, mm, I think mm. it solves so many problems and, and homelessness as well. Mm, mm, particularly if people could be accommodated on the yard, like you say, yeah. you know. Gosh, yeah. And actually, I just, I, I really want so many people to watch this interview because actually, Ash, you've got so much wisdom that people could listen to, um, you know, and good ideas that, actually, if we think in a slightly more, like I said, out of the box fashion is just waiting for that. There's a whole world out there waiting for the racing industry that we just don't even really think about at the moment. We've got a few minutes left. So if anyone wants to pop some questions in, um, do feel free. Um, 
but yeah I was just going to ask you like what do you what do you think is like the best thing about working in racing Ash like what was your favorite thing that you'd say is like a, apart from the horses themselves obviously it's like the biggest draw in for for people who might be considering a career in that industry um I would say the best thing about racing is the adrenaline rush <laughs> anybody that is they just love to go fast or do something that you think actually could be slightly dangerous but you want to do it anyway that is racing isn't it you know you mm -hmm. get on a young horse you don't know what's going to do to you, <laughs> you <laughs> might get to the top of the gallops it might dump you at the start you don't know that's a gamble so you know it's no day is the same and you know for people that don't like sort of too much routine and too much samey samey stuff I think you know yeah definitely adrenaline because when your horses are out running as well you know, racing in, in whatever rate, it doesn't have to be a really competitive race. It can be, you know, a little bumper or something. Mm. But when they go out and you see them doing that, you can't help but get excited. Mm. Mm. Definitely, definitely. There we go. Well, thanks ever so much, Ash, for your time. I think we'll wind it up there. But you have been a fabulous guest. I know you've been doing lots of interviews this year. Um, and where can people find you? And um, we've mentioned your Instagram, but um, where's the best place for people to see more of your work and, and what you're up to if they're interested in following your journey? In, at the moment, it's mainly my Instagram, um, but I do have a Facebook, which is Ashley Witchard. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks for Ashley Witchard. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it says on the tin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so as I said, this interview will be on the Women in Racing website in the next few days. Thanks so much, Ash. It's been such a pleasure to chat to you. Um, I've had a really, really lovely hour, actually. Um, and yeah, um, we will be seeing more of Ash in future. Hopefully in 2021, we will be back to physical events so we can all see one another and meet, actually, meet up in person. Um, we've got some plans for things happening next year. The Racing Home Project is continuing. Um, there'll be some more mentoring things hitting the website and we will be continuing this season of interviews. There'll be a few more coming up between now and Christmas and hopefully into the new year as well. So um, do stay tuned, spread the word around and yeah, share this with anyone that you think might enjoy it. Um, we will pop it out on our social media in the next few days. But thanks, Ash. Have a good evening, everybody. And thank you very much. Bye now. Bye-bye.